Hey everyone, we have an exciting training today. I am going to be talking about how do you save a marriage when your husband won't go to therapy? This is one of the biggest barriers that clients come to me with or women come to me with and then eventually become my clients because like, I don't know how to do this. I've read books, I'm going to individual therapy, but my husband won't go to therapy and it feels like such a bottleneck. So today we're gonna to talk all about how do you actually go about saving a marriage when he won't engage in that process of going to therapy. So I'm Beth Miller, I am the marriage coach. I am the founder of the Marriage Saver Program and I help wives save their marriages in a matter of 12 weeks. I help them rebuild trust. I help them, oh, is that, oh, Anyway, surprise, Mandy's joining us, one of my former clients, but I helped her along with any of my other clients that come in, rebuild trust, get their husbands to open up, end those ruminating thoughts and heal from trauma because this is this is a horrific experience that you are going through and can get through. So I have Mandy here. I think Mandy's joining right now. We'll just wait for her to get in. But Mandy is one of my former clients. She had her D-Day a year ago, September 2023. Three, oh no, September 2022. Sorry, she joined me in September 2023, um, a year after D Day. So I'm going to click here. Maybe I need to let her in. Okay, hopefully you can get in. Hopefully you can get in, Mandy. But um, yeah, she joined me a year ago, and we want to talk about her, how she did this, how she saved her marriage when her husband didn't go to therapy. She is an amazing mom, um, two kids, and her and her husband have been married 20 years um, as of March. And she came to me, we'll call her husband Bruce, um, after her husband had a physical and emotional affair. And the tricky thing about her situation is that the affair partner, who we'll call Lisa, lives in her community and is actually part of the same friend group as her children. So she can't get away from Lisa. Lisa is part of their lives in some capacity because she's in the community. So it def definitely does complicate things because her husband Bruce and her have to talk to the affair partner. All right, we're gonna start somewhere in the middle. And as we start somewhere in the middle of your journey, I'm sure we will unpack most of the details of your relationship. So let's just get into this right off the get go. Um, Bruce, your husband, yes. did he go to individual counseling? No, he did not do any individual uh, counseling. Um, we did, um, prior to me starting with you, we did do a um, similar uh, type thing with a couple. Um, and it was a couple's program, I guess you would say, um, that kind of focused on working on yourself for the first several weeks. And then you worked on things as a couple. Um, so we did do that and he did participate in that for quite a while. I would say, um, four to six weeks probably. Um, and then he ended up dropping out of it because they uh were kind of like encouraging him to he hadn't completely like stopped talking to his affair partner so they were encouraging him and calling him out on that and uh he f said he felt attacked and so he quit that yeah and for those who maybe missed the beginning his affair partner is part of their friend group and is someone they see regularly, which makes this such a difficult situation. And it sounds like at that point he was refusing to cut off ties. And how do you cut off ties with someone who's in your community who you're seeing quite often? What was their suggestion? Um, It wasn't like, it was, you know, if you need to talk to her th about things like related to, you know, our group and our kids group, um, just do that or have those directed through me. Uh, um, so that was their suggestion. Why do you, just, think, uh, yeah, why do you think he, he wouldn't cut off ties? At that stage, why was he not willing to do so? Um, like knowing more now, like I guess like what he had explained to me was they had become like really close friends and she had become his like, safe space like someone he felt he could open up to and he had started like opening up and I think he didn't want to cut things off because number one he wasn't really sure like where things were going with them I guess uh you know if it could lead to more and uh things were 
suffer so bad, like with our marriage, like he just didn't see us being able to get past it or find a way through it. So the thought of giving up on that, that was like peaceful and I guess was too much for him. And let's talk about that. Your marriage was not in a great place and he was connecting with her. That was some sort of safe place, somewhere mm-hmm. an outlet as a friend, um, which had been clearly not friends before. What was the issues? What were the biggest struggles in your marriage? What would he say? What would you say? Um, he said that, um, I had like completely shut down on him and, uh, was not connecting with him and, um, that he kind of felt like I was trying to control him. Yes. Yeah, so were the, his biggest things. Yeah. And so why did he go outside? Why did he reach out to Lisa? And I guess Lisa was already part of the group. So friend group. So did it just naturally happen? The two of them connecting kind of as friends and then it went emotional and physical. Is that what happened because of the distance between the two of you? Yeah. I think, um, they had spent, um, some, spent some time like, um, out activities with our kids group. Um, and then had just started talking because of that. And then, then they were just connecting at events and then for some, whatever reason, decided to exchange numbers and start connecting on the phone. Um, and then I, don't, I think that, that happened for like five months before like the physical part actually started. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. This is so difficult. I, you, you have been through a lot. You have, and I just want to commend you on where you are now. We will get to that part in a bit. Um, but back to this, you guys tried. You, he was engaging. He was ready to kind of connect again, work on your mm-hmm. marriage. He wasn't ready to cut off ties with Lisa. So how did this make you feel? Like at this stage, are you wanting to get a divorce? Are you feeling completely hopeless? Like he's like, I'm done. I'm not working on this program anymore. Where did that leave you? How did you feel? Um, I felt really discouraged. Um, and, and was also just, just kind of like, how could he not want to work on our marriage? You know, like he committed to our marriage. Like, how could he just give up on it? So easy is kind of how I felt. Um, but then like I realized that even if we did end up separating or getting divorced, that I would never, like, like if I didn't work on myself and focus on myself, that I would never be in a place to, you know, continue to work on our marriage or be in another relationship down the road if our marriage didn't work out. Yeah, that's incredible that you had that foresight being like, I need I need to take my power and control back over my happiness. Yes, no. So at that point, you're like, okay, I'm going to work on me. And when you think I'm going to work on me, what were you wanting to work on? Um, I wanted to work on my self-esteem. I wanted to work on finding me again because I realized I had kind of lost me in being focused on, you know, being a mom and putting everything into the kids. And I think I dove into, you know, being a mom a little more when things started getting rocky with our marriage, just, you know, for something to focus on, I guess. Um, And I just kind of lost touch with me. Like I wasn't making myself a priority anymore. Did you go to individual therapy? No, I did not. But what just working a strategy? Okay. Because I know about a year after D-Day, you came and to me. So what mm-hmm. resources were you using to help your marriage and help yourself? Um, what was he doing at this stage? Uh, that kind of in between doing the six mm-hmm. six weeks that you guys do some of that work together. What, what other strategies were you using? What was he doing? What were you doing? Well, I still continued the program. Um, on myself, I think it was like a 12 week program. So I kind of continued that with just me and, um, just my part. I mean, he was still participating a little bit, like once a week they had live things and we would still get on and like watch those together. He just wasn't, um, doing all of the work and, um, then 
And yeah, I just, until I worked with you, I was just kind of working with those strategies that they had given me, but they were a little hard because a lot of it was focused on the marriage versus just, you know, the individual. What was communication like between the two of you at this point? Was it, were you avoidant, not speaking up, or were you maybe getting angry? How about him? Was he getting angry? Was he shutting down? Was he avoidant? What was communication like? Um, like during when, after D-Dude? During this time after D-Day, yes. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely better after D-Day, before D-Day. Like when I would call him um, and he would be on the phone, like with her, he would just get like really angry and tell me this was his alone time and he needed this time. Like he just didn't want me like calling or talking to him. But during the time when... um. I mean, we were talking some, but not like in depth about what we needed to. And when I would try to bring things up, he would kind of shut down or get defensive. Like we were able to work through a little bit of it, but not, not as much because I mean, he still had a lot of work to do on himself as well. And yeah. he did. He had a lot of work to do on himself and he wasn't willing to, he didn't see what the big deal was that he was still connecting with her. I know like self-esteem wise, like you said, it was at times a bit in the gutters, right? Um, You'd seen messages that he'd said, like you look gorgeous or he was really supporting her, um, which really I know impacted you. Like, why is he not doing that for me? So how did you, how did you really change? Well, because right now it sounds like you're working on yourself. You're like, I'm going to work on myself and then that'll, ideally work on the marriage so what were you doing right now too I know you're working with me but if you want to share like what kind of things were you working on to really overcome that self-esteem and the confidence the part that's a bit shattered right because you've reached out to someone else right I mean I just had to dig down deep and realize that you know happiness is really like an inside job um I had to be happy with myself I had to like reconnect with my goals, like what I wanted in life, what I wanted for me and um, just really making sure that I was taking time for myself. Like I made sure I was taking like an hour or each day for myself, um, whether that be, you know, over some over my lunch hour and then some in the evenings, like I just really made sure to find time to focus on myself. And I just had to not uh, try not to focus on what he was doing because that's what was kind of keeping me in the hamster wheel, like constantly worrying, like, what's he doing? Is he calling her? Is he texting her? Like, I just had to focus on me and take the focus off of him. Yeah. And during this time, it wasn't easy. He wasn't necessarily connecting with you. He wasn't always working on the marriage. In fact, at times he had one foot out the door right. where it felt like divorce could be your your path. So tell me a little bit more about that. Like he actually grew a bit further apart than closer during that time. Yeah. For um, a while, he had moved down to our basement. Um He was making, he was also making plans to move into an apartment or rent a house. Um, and during that time, um, again, I just, I just had to like focus on myself and realize that, um, you know, if this is really the path I'm supposed to be on, like if we really are meant to work this out, it will happen. Um, but I knew that, like, both of us needed to work on ourselves first. Um, we did set down, like, some ground rules for when he was, um, down in the basement. Like, we did, I made, made sure, like, I requested that I still want to have some personal connection time. So, like, every evening we would still have some personal connection before we, like, went our separate ways for the evening. But other than, I mean, he wasn't like living down there. He was just sleeping down there. So. Which was really difficult. It was really difficult. And I want to say, I'm so proud of you. Like you, 
you had me every single day. <laughs> You'd be like, Beth, this is what we talked about the night before. This is where I maybe still need to talk about. Do you have any suggestions? So as alone as it can feel, I was with you every day and you were so, so good at implementing different strategies to try and open up that communication because he knew he needed to work on himself, but he really wasn't taking a lot of action at the time. Right. He, he was like, he knew, like I hear this so often from wives. It's like, he needs some space so he can figure things out. Mm -hmm. What, what are they figuring out? We still don't often know. Like, do they even know what they have to figure out? Right. They just know they need to figure something out. And it's, it's, it's boggling to me at times. So what was he trying to figure out? Did you ever get the answers? Um, I think he himself was also trying to connect with himself again, you know, and, um, just kind of really see what his goals were and what he wanted in life. And I think a lot of it was also like him dealing with his demons of, you know, what caused him to have the affair and like, you know, how, like, how could he do that kind of? Yeah. And so in these moments of him sleeping in the basement, thinking he's potentially planning to move out, like you said, you had this belief of if our marriage is meant to be, it's meant to be. And that helped combat a lot of the fear. And so you really step back and you got into a place of surrender, a place of flow. And what happens is during that time, what I witnessed you do is you're really working on any undesirable emotions that came up. If you're feeling a tad jealous that he might be talking to her, if you're feeling fearful that he's going to leave, um, if you're feeling angry, if these emotions were coming up, you were really unpacking them with yourself first before you'd have these evening check-ins so that when you did have those evening check-ins, it's like you're a clean slate. You could go in breathing like regularly and you could ask them questions. I know you used a lot of curious questions like, um, tell me about this. That makes sense. Like you would respond with empathy. Um, I understand that. Can you tell me more? Um, so you really approached it from curiosity to engage him so that you didn't, he didn't perceive you as controlling. He, you weren't making him feel guilty. It feels so weird, but a lot of husbands feel really guilty, but it comes across as anger and shutting down. Mm -hmm. They don't want to deal with what, they, what they've done to you, but it, they, they show anger, which then makes us so frustrated because why don't they feel bad? Why are they not giving us a true apology? Um, so you did a lot to prep yourself before you had those evening conversations. Mm -hmm. And over time, you can like talk me to us a little bit about this, but he started to soften. Things started to change. And this all wasn't like roses, like, oh, now I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm working myself and now it's just up, up, up. Like there was some mm -hmm. doubt. You're like, is this even working? But you would go back to that route of, you know, if this is meant to be, it'll be, I want to be happy. I'm in charge of my own happiness. And you really did surrender. But tell me a little bit about this. Like, how would you prep yourself for these conversations that eventually got him to open up more and more? Um, I would just kind of, um, go through the root of kind of first of all like why I needed to know like if it was certain details I needed to know or um I would just uh kind of go through all the scenarios I guess um and then you know just to remind myself like to kind of keep a clear head and like, I don't want this to lead to an argument. And what can I do if I start to see it go that way? Like, you know, tell him we need to step back or let's revisit this leader. And a lot of times when I did bring questions to him, you know, I would say, you know, if I'm catching you off guard and you're not ready to speak about this, like right now, when do you think would be a good time for us to like revisit it? And Sometimes it was a day or two later, but I knew that if I was just, you know, if I would just keep pressing him and drilling him, that uh, I would not get any of the answers that I would want. And he would go back into completely shutting down again. Yeah, so you did a lot. You really exercised patience in communicating with him like the inside sometimes for a lot of clients I work with and women it just eats them up they just want to know they want to know so the idea of waiting an hour 12 hours 24 hours and for you sometimes 48 hours to revisit a conversation mm -hmm. can be really difficult so it's about coming up with strategies so that you can give him the proper space but then also setting the boundary of we do need to finish this conversation so when conversations do go 
almost sideways or you can catch them before they go sideways, it's really important that you say, okay, we need to shut this down, but let's repair this and set a date. Because if you don't have the date to be to repair, what happens is you can then feel as a wife neglected, abandoned, rejected, like your feelings don't care, like things don't matter. Um, that's when we can start spiraling into other thoughts, which we want to keep at bay by keeping control of the situation by, okay, we are going to revisit this in this amount of time and two days. So what do we do in the meantime? Like, what do we do to like calm our minds to get to 48 hours? How are you supposed to work, be a mom, sleep at night, knowing that this conversation needs to happen? Plus all the other questions that are kind of generating during those, those mm -hmm. hours. So I know things that you did was journaling. Um, you did what we call hypno journeying, which is like these deep meditative tracks that really get your mind relaxed. Um, and then you can go back to the times where you felt self-doubt about yourself or your relationship. That would be the self-doubt hypno journey. Or you could do trigger hypno journey, which is just a general activation of an undesirable emotion going into it and releasing it, releasing the anger, the sadness, the pain associated it, with it. Um, and so a lot of the beliefs that I know you worked on to help you get through those couple of days, like there was times where you felt insignificant, right? You felt unlovable, like he wasn't loving you the way you needed to, you weren't important. And so you do these hypno journeys to really get your worth in a better place, going back to times where you felt insignificant or unheard and rewriting your brain, like through neuroplasticity and neuroscience, you were creating new neural pathways that were firing. You know what? I am significant. I am important. I am enough. And that was helping you get through those those days. So yeah, feel, feel feel to share a little bit more about how you got through those lapses and being able to have these conversations. Yeah, I think um, the hypno journeys were huge. Um, just kind of being in that relaxed state. And like you said, going back to other times, like in your childhood, or even just, you know, like a year or so ago, um, and just kind of going back to those and just releasing all those emotions, like really it, I mean, it does just kind of like it gets it out of your brain. So you're not thinking about it anymore and you're able to reprogram those moments, like realizing that maybe what you experienced in those moments isn't really what your brain has made you think. Um, and then like you said, just the affirmations, um, just going through those it was every day and like every night before bed, just reminding yourself like how important you are and you are loved and um, just kind of reminding yourself of that because it's easy to forget sometimes when we get stuck in the rut of everything else. Yeah. And you could have. I I could have told you to look in the mirror every day, Mandy. I could have been like, go to the mirror and look at the mirror and say, I'm significant. I'm important. I love myself. But it takes so long. Like we're talking months and months and months and months to really get your brain to create a new neural pathway. I love myself. But when you get in that deeply relaxed brain state, which is just before sleep, but you're not fully asleep, you're, you're alert. It's called a theta brainwave state. You're able to like actually rewrite some of the, some of the beliefs that were in there. Um, so I had another question for you in there too. A lot of women that I work with, like the strategy here, like what you're telling me is he stopped wanting to really actively work on the marriage. He was just kind of taking some time to work on himself, whatever that meant, right? Um, dealing with his own stuff and however he was doing it. We never really actually knew what he was doing. Um, a lot of women I work with get angry. They're like, why do I have to do all this work? He's the one who did this to me. He's the one who stepped outside the marriage. He's the one who betrayed me. He's the one who broke our trust. Why do I now have to work on myself? He's shattered my self-confidence. He's made me feel unheard and significant. Why am I having to do this? And a lot of women come to me feeling angry. They know they need to do it because what other option do we have? But how? what was your mindset like during this time of he's taking some space to work on himself a little bit like that we don't really fully know, but that you had to then do all this work. You were working so hard every single day. Like you said, you take an hour for yourself to try and dig into this stuff. How, did you feel angry or were you like, you know what, I need to do this? Um, I was off and on angry, but then, I mean, I just realized I didn't like the person that I had become. I didn't like the, I don't know, for lack of a better word, the crazy person, right, that was obsessed with what is he doing all the time. Like, I did not want to be that person. Um, I felt like, just not healthy, like, you know, not only emotionally sick, but like physically sick because I was just in that rut constantly. And I knew that 
um, I needed to focus on myself and I needed to get myself better. And like I said, just even if we didn't work out, like I knew that I did not like the person I had become and that I needed to work to fix that. And hopefully, you know, in time he would see that and start wanting to fix himself. But I knew I needed to make myself a priority regardless of the outcome of our marriage. So you just said something important. You're doing it in hopes that he would see something different. So tell me, did he see the changes in you? Did that cause him to respond differently? Did he see this in you? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think he started to see me being at peace. Um, and I don't know if it <laughs> kind of set off a light bulb like, Oh, you know, maybe she can be my piece also, like, you know, instead of Lisa, maybe she can be my piece. Um, and then he started doing some work on himself as well. Um, I mean, he's still working on himself and we're still, you know, working on our marriage, but we've made tremendous strides towards, you know, working on healing it. Yeah, you are the catalyst for change. You really are. And so many women are because like, I'm miserable. I'm so unhappy. Like, like you just said, I don't like the person I am right now. You probably found this anger within you or this deep sadness within you. You never knew existed because of this deep low of what was happening in your relationship. Um, So let me ask you, have you been able to rebuild trust in your marriage? Do you trust him? I mean, that's still a work in progress. I don't know. I've read a lot of studies about it. Like how it takes, I don't know, several years, right, of them consistently doing the same, you know, behaviors uh, to rebuild it. So it's getting there. Um, He is doing like different check-ins and things like that. And, uh, you know, I think as long as he is consistent with his behaviors and the check-ins and kind of showing me that he does want to rebuild trust with me. Like I think in time, it definitely will get there. Yeah. You nailed it right now. Like the equation to rebuilding trust is consistency over time. As humans, we like patterns. We like, we like when things kind of fit in the box. Like if the the square peg fits in the square hole, like we want to make sense in the moment he's maybe late or he's not answering his phone. I know that was a big trigger for you. If he was driving home from work and he wouldn't answer his phone because that was a behavior he had when he would talk to Lisa, if that can kind of send us into a spiral, but you have different coping mechanisms now. If you can't get a hold of him while he's driving home, where, what do you do now? Um, just find something else to do to take my mind off of it. Yeah. Does your mind still go there? Do you think Like, is it the initial, maybe he's talking to her, but then you catch it right away? Yeah. I mean, it's still there a little bit, but I'm not as triggered as I was by it. Um, And then, like, I have, when I, like, before I would call and he would, you know, I would just, like, keep calling. But then that would also trigger him because he would think that I'm, like, you know, checking in on him. Uh. So I just call once and then like I'll leave a voicemail or text and then just move on and he'll, he usually calls me right back, you know, but I I found that like if I'm triggered and then I trigger him, then that's when things really like spiral. So yeah, and I think that's, uh, that's good. That I'm glad. Thank you for sharing that because like you said, consistency over time, maybe there'll be a day and there probably will, but you'll call and he doesn't answer. And I think that that little trigger, that little voice in our head, and we can love that little voice within you, the one that's like, maybe he's talking to her. You can hear that little voice. You can send her the love being like, we're okay. We're safe. We're going to leave a text message saying, call me when you get a chance, but we're going to go do something else. We don't need to ruminate on this anymore. So that little part of you was formed around that time when you found out about this. And she's still there, that little voice, but is taking control over that voice, recognizing that voice, sending it love, not being like, don't, we're not going to do this, like trying to willpower yourself into it. Instead, you get into a place of flow where you're like, okay, I see this. I understand this. Does that, does that, what you, do you feel that? Is that kind of what you resonate? Yeah, with? yeah, yeah definitely. absolutely. Um, do you forgive him? It's a big one. Do you forgive him for what he's done? Yeah, I do. That's massive. 
like that's massive like how do you forgive for anyone watching this like how how do you forgive for me like i just had to realize it's um not that i'm excusing him of his actions but i just feel like what he did like he he was not the per like that person that did those things was not his true self and it was not the person that i married like he himself was hurting i guess if that makes sense and dealing with demons that he was not able to control yeah thank you no i should just put this out there this part's not scripted at all like i don't know mandy mandy was my client a year ago we worked together in within probably i think we you extended your program we worked together for yeah. 12 weeks and you're like hey, beth i'm not ready to get rid of you yet which is so common so many clients are like i just want to still have that daily touch point um, or even every couple days touch point, but eventually you're like, I'm ready to fly out of the nest. So we haven't really chatted in months. And so I'm getting these little updates as well. And I guess one of my questions now too is, is your marriage better? Is it better than it was before? Yeah, it's definitely better. Um, even I would say within the last, I don't know, month, um, like I just feel something different, like, about it in the air. I don't know. Like we're laughing again and joking and, um, we're, I mean, we're still not having like the full emotional, um, just discussions that I would, you know, like, I don't know that he ever will completely just like pour his heart out. Like, you know, I don't think he's built that way, but, um, we are talking more about different things. And I mean, he's now making plans. Like before it was a big deal to make plans for the next week. And now he's making plans for several months from now. And he's even like both of our kids are in high school. So in the next four years, we could be completely empty nesters. And he's made different comments about that, you know, about like, what it's going to be like when we are empty nesters and what we're going to do, like as a couple different plans like that. So. Yeah. That, that, isn't that reassuring? Right. It feels really good. It's exciting too. It brings an excitement. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, we're staying married. Yeah. He's, he's on board. It feels good. Um, we had a question and I think I'm going to tie it into another question. You'd mentioned kind of a few minutes ago that he's working on himself and he's continuing to work on himself now. And then the question here is, how do you get rid of his demons? So let's let's kind of merge those together. What has he been doing to work on himself? Um, so he had gotten, I don't even remember what the book was. Um, I think I sent it to you, but it, it was a male counselor that he had saw on like TikTok or Instagram. Um, so he had gotten his book and he did the audio book of that and then I think he's just been reading, um, some like self-help books and podcasts. Um, yeah. If you, if you get a chance, maybe you could put that in the comments later on. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure there's some women who would love to know, um, cause there's some, yeah, there are some great resources out there for men when they're with, when they're wanting to buy in. So, um, as Amy said, how do you get rid of his demons? Like, was there a point where you could tell? where there was massive shifts. And like you said, the last month there's been a shift, but could you see that he, he was buying in? Like, tell us a little bit more about what you noticed as he was working on himself. Um, I guess kind of the same thing with me. Like, um, I could just tell when he was working through a lot of that, like he just felt lighter, um, more like playful and free, I guess. Um, I think he still has a lot that he's unpacking. Um, and, and like every once in a while, like I said, we hardly talk about the affair at all. But when I do bring it up, he still kind of wonders, like, are we going to completely get past this? Like, is there going to be a time when we're not bringing it up anymore? Um, <laughs> and what are your thoughts? But, that what are your thoughts will there ever be a time when you don't need to bring it up and i think with time yeah it, we will be able to and i try really 
hard, like, not to bring it up because unless, like, something happens and I need to answer more, you know, get more questions from him or, um, kind of connect with him a little more. But, um, like, I try not to continually bring it up because I also don't want to continually throw it in his face or seem like I am keeping score, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And what kind of things are you wanting to bring up? What kind of questions still arise or comments that you want to make? Um, the most recent one, I guess, um, that we talked about was like, I just, in the back of my mind, still had this, like, fear that he may still be in love with her and that even though they ended things and things did not work out, like, in the back of his mind, that they had something or saw something in her that he didn't see in me or didn't see in our marriage or didn't think that we would have in our marriage, I guess. Um, so I kind of brought that up. Like I said, Hey, can we talk or I want to share with you some fears that I have with moving forward with our marriage. So I kind of had some of my pain and then he gave me some of his, but at that time, like he didn't really acknowledge that fear of mine. Like he didn't say anything, but then, um, a couple of days later, I brought it back up again, you know? And, like, he just said, we had something, I'm not sure what it was, but the key thing you need to take away from it is that we had something, like, so. Yeah. And how did that make you feel? It, was that enough to answer your fear, put your fear at bay? Yeah, I put it at bay. I mean, I'm not saying it won't come up again, but yeah, <laughs> Make it not come up again if you are still with me. What we would probably do is like the fear hypno journey, or we do the self doubt hypno journey. Mm-hmm. And what we would do is work on that fear of like closing the door. Like they had a thing, he doesn't know what that thing is, but you know what? Today we have a good thing. Today he is different, I'm different, which makes a different relationship. And just that surrender of right now we're supposed to be married. Like, I don't want to say he'll ever you know what, we don't want to go there right now, but the fear is I know I'm worthy of a healthy relationship. I am lovable. I am significant. I am heard. And just reinforcing those beliefs about yourself that, you know what, I am worthy of his love. I am worthy of others' love. Um, And that I don't need to put this fear in place right now because what I see is solid and I have the proper boundaries. We could even do the boundaries. I have the boundaries in place. Uh, Boundaries are our check-ins. And like you said, trust is consistency over time. And then we have those check-ins that help Mm -hmm. us check in each other um so yeah i know you have a, a access to the portal still so go ahead you could try the fear of no journey the self the boundary of no journey just to really reinforce it again it's that little voice within you there's these little voices that's like maybe maybe he does love her and he's just sticking around for the kids or because of his image um but really working on that that i'm, I'm worthy i'm heard i am i'm lovable yeah. um with all that said mandy is there anything else you want to share anything you want to add any advice you have for anyone who's in this group, who's going through this, um, really feeling stuck, really feeling like they can't trust, they can't get their husband to open up. What what, would, what advice would you have or what would you like to add to this conversation? Um, I think like one big thing for me, and it was actually something that he said, um, you know, we have to mourn the loss of our old marriage um, because that one didn't work. I mean, there are parts of it that were working, but that marriage didn't work. Like that wasn't working. So we have to mourn that and let that go to rebuild and move on to our new better marriage. Oh, I love that. And I actually have clients who get new rings. They renew their vows. They even have just like a little like special ceremony between the two of them. Um, You know, I thought of another question because someone posted a question here, but I'm going to paraphrase it. Do you, and so many clients of mine are stuck in this at times and we work through it, but they feel like if they let go of their sadness or anger in particular towards their husband that he did this, that they, because they're not angry anymore, the, the wife's not angry anymore, he'll think he got away with it or he'll forget how much he hurt her mm-hmm. um, or that, yeah, he got away with no consequences. Are, where are you in that thought of like, do you still need to like, I don't want to use the word torture, but do you still need to project anger at him? Or have you got to a place of complete peace where you're like, you know what? I, I trust that 
he will not forget the pain he's caused me or yeah tell me a little bit more about this yeah i mean for a while i was stuck on that too i was stuck on consequences because like i did not broadcast their affair to our friend group or anything like that and so i was very stuck on like i knew he was having consequences um but like i was really stuck on her having consequences too and i guess a little bit him and i just kind of realized like um that he is i mean he is in fact dealing with his own consequences like he is having to deal with like the fact that he hurt me and that he broke my trust and that he broke our marriage vows and um you know i just have to be hopeful that um you know we are going to let this go but that he is then going to do you know the work that he needs to to kind of rebuild that trust and to show me that um he is hurtful and sorry for what he did yeah that's it's that is taking the high road isn't it being like i especially if you're religious for some people they know that god will put in the place put in place like what mm-hmm. needs to happen and like he'll have to go down that path um but for everyone else whether religion or not just knowing that you know what i trust that i'm doing my work and i don't want to hold him hostage in my brain anymore because that resentment of i need him to suffer i need him to have consequences it's real it's real of course mm-hmm. he hurt mm-hmm. bad he hurt as much as mm-hmm. you're hurting it's a totally normal feeling but um, my mother-in-law used to say by doing that we're keeping someone hostage in our brain rent free it's only us mm-hmm. that's hurting that um i thought of another question I, I i'm thinking maybe some people out there are wondering she's in your community she you see her you have to talk to her to lisa have you ever approached her and i know the answer to this but have you ever approached her or maybe maybe things have changed in the last few months but have you ever approached her have you ever talked to her about what's happened between your husband bruce and her i didn't um i wanted to really bad but i was urged um by my husband not to um i don't know if he- he just didn't want like to create the added drama of me doing that. She's kind of like completely stepped out of like, she's not really in our friend group. She's not hanging out with us outside of our activities. And she's even kind of stepped back a lot in the activities. So we don't see her that much anymore. Um, what I did do is I wrote a letter to her. Um, and then I actually had Tim read it and then we burnt it in a fire. That was powerful. And it took, it's so interesting how long that took to actually mm-hmm. happen. I know you had a plan and then something came up It planned. I think it was raining. Like it was just a bit of a process, but it happened and it was right. really powerful for the two of you. Yeah. Yeah. Another question. Is he back in the bedroom? Has he moved back upstairs? Yeah. Yay. Um, we moved back upstairs like four months ago, I think. Yeah, that's great. Great. So, yeah, you know, I guess, is there anything, any last words that you have? Any other things that you want to add? Thank you for the last thing that you said about, um, yeah, about your marriage and a new marriage 2.0. Is mm-hmm. there anything else you want to add? No, I think, I mean, I would just say, like, focus on yourself. Like, you deserve um, the inner peace of kind of working on yourself and, um just, I know it's hard. Just try not to focus on what he's doing. Like, it sounds impossible, but yeah. I mean, with time, you can get there. And I think, oh, go ahead, sorry. keep going. I'm uh, interrupting you. Keep going. With cool, no. And then the other thing I was just gonna say about before with the consequences, like you know, I think kind of where you were going there, like you just have to realize, like. You said if you are a religious person that, you know, God will make sure the consequences are dealt out to them or, you know, some people believe in karma. So, yeah. It's that surrender. This is out of your control. It's not your job, right? Mm-hmm. It's letting go of that control. Um, and a lot of the strategies, kind of like you said, you 
I give those to you every single day. I'm like, okay, customize. It's you and I, it wasn't a group program. All my clients have direct access to me every single day. And so I'm in it with you. And depending on what you're feeling that day, what emotions coming up, what thoughts are coming up, what worries, concerns you have, we are combating that every single day with a tailored strategy. Um, So that you always feel like you're in control and you have a game plan that you're moving towards that we have an end goal. So unlike traditional therapy where you come see me once a week, every two weeks for an hour, I'm with you every day getting little... Mm -hmm little uh, updates, which is how we changed our brain, how we changed the neural pathways that were firing those old, undesirable, low emotion feelings. Um, we worked really hard every day um, to do this. So, and mm-hmm. I'm just proud of you. And I want to thank you on behalf of everyone in this group for, for having the courage to come on and share your journey. Because I know this isn't easy and um, to bring this stuff back up, but I'm sure this will help so many other women, inspire them and um, really help them on this path of healing. Thank you so much. Yeah, you, thanks for having me on and letting me share my story. But I appreciate that. All right, Mandy, we'll catch up soon. And for now, say bye to everyone. Bye.